and pregnancy. This is a common and serious complication that can begin in the second trimester and continue through the early postpartum period. Close to 10% of pregnant women develop this condition and it is the leading or a leading cause of perinatal death. Prior to watching this lecture, make sure you watch the Khan Academy video that is entitled Preeclampsia. In addition, review the information in the McKinney textbook on, in Chapter 25 for the risk factors that increase the chance of a woman developing pregnancy-induced hypertension, also known as PIH. Let's begin with a review of the terminology. This was discussed in the Khan Academy video. So chronic hypertension is exactly that. A patient has hypertension either before conception or it is discovered prior to the 20th week of gestation. A woman with chronic hypertension can have superimposed pregnancy-induced hypertension as the pregnancy progresses. Gestational hypertension differs. It develops after 20 weeks and up to 48 hours to a full week postpartum. Gestational hypertension does not have proteinuria. If proteinuria develops, the patient is reclassified as having preeclampsia. Preeclampsia has a long definition. So the official definition is hypertension develops after the 20th week of gestation with a systolic reading of greater or equal to 140 and a diastolic reading of greater or equal to 90 with proteinuria that's greater or equal to 1 plus when you use the dipstick. You will hear the term pregnancy-induced hypertension or PIH as we like to abbreviate it often when caring for pregnant women. We're always on the lookout for this condition during prenatal visits as well as when they enter labor and delivery in the recovery room and once they're transferred to postpartum. This is a broad term that has been around for decades and refers to gestational hypertension, preeclampsia, and eclampsia. This slide gives you a depiction of the difference between PIH and chronic hypertension and how it can evolve. Now eclampsia is worsening preeclampsia. It is a progression that causes neurologic irritability resulting in seizures. Oftentimes they'll start in the face where there's going to be twitching and then it progresses down the body so that there is tonic-clonic activity. The patient may also develop pulmonary edema, heart failure, and or have a cerebral hemorrhage. Poor perfusion to the kidneys results in oliguria, which is defined as a urine output of less than 30 mLs per hour. So the newer classifications are more distinct, and this helps physicians and nurses categorize the risk and then manage the patient. A woman can progress from gestational hypertension to preeclampsia and eclampsia. So you always need to be prepared and monitor for this change in status. One of the serious complications of PIH, preeclampsia or eclampsia, is what we call HELP syndrome. And it's capital H-E-L-L-P. This is an acronym for hemolysis, which is of the red cells, elevated liver enzymes, and low platelets. Women who develop this condition are critically ill and often end up being transferred to ICU after delivery. Review this diagram of the two categories of hypertension, noting the differences in the clinical manifestations.
Pregnancy-induced hypertension has a variety of systemic effects on the maternal kidney, liver, brain, and lungs due to vasospasm slash vasoconstriction. Maternal vasoconstriction causes reduced flow and perfusion to the placenta, resulting in fetal complications such as intrauterine growth retardation, and we abbreviate that IUGR, and fetal distress with or without labor. So this could be a woman who comes in for a stress test or a non-stress test. We put her on the monitor, she has high blood pressure, even without contractions, we're seeing fetal distress. So in relation to pregnancy-induced hypertension that causes this vasoconstriction, you're going to hear this physiologic process called uteroplacental insufficiency, and that's abbreviated UPI. The baby simply has no reserve, especially during labor, as evidenced by decelerations of the fetal heart rate or a flat baseline. There's no variability. And you will we'll learn more about this when we go through the labor and delivery content. The IUGR develops over time. In a normal pregnancy, when we're looking at an ultrasound, we expect to see symmetric fetal growth as measured by the femur length, the size of the abdomen, and the head. With IUGR, the growth slows, initially affecting the abdomen and the extremities, and eventually the head. And then this is known as asymmetric IUGR. The hallmark symptoms of PIH are edema, hypertension, and proteinuria. As mentioned earlier in the lecture, a serious life-threatening complication of PIH is HELP syndrome. In addition to abnormal blood pressure and proteinuria, the classic signs and symptoms of this disorder include a severe headache, abdominal pain that's in the right upper quadrant, or in the epigastric area, and this is due to liver inflammation. She also has severe edema. Be sure to tune in to Complications in Pregnancy, PIH Part 2, that discusses the therapeutic management and nursing interventions to promote good outcomes in the mother and baby.